Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you to the seventh lecture of uh, our course on ADR and arbitration. And we have really moved ahead uh, significantly in Arbitration Conciliation Act. In the process, what we have discussed so far, we introduced the idea of ADR. From there, we moved to Arbitration Conciliation Act. And we have understood the basics of Arbitration Conciliation Act in the sense as to what is arbitration, what is an award, what is an arbitration agreement, what are there in Section 7, how an agreement is different from agreement for expert advice. And in the last class, if you recall, we were trying to understand Section 8 and the, the differences between Section 8 and Section 45. So therefore, there is an agreement, you go for arbitration. If there is no agreement, you cannot do arbitration. That is what we have understood in sections 7 and 8. 8 says if there is an agreement, you do not have any option but to go for arbitration. Because if you commit breach and go to some other forum, say for example, if you go to court, the other party has the standing to approach the court and request the court to refer the matter for arbitration. We refer to P. Anand Gajpati Raju case, if you remember, and I asked you to go back to the slide which contained the points with uh, red highlighted portions because those red highlighted portions are the changes which have come in the course of say uh, 20 years from 1996 to 2015 by way of decisions of, of, of Sukanya holding, the decision of Pink City Midway Petroleum case, Chloro controls and finally the amendment of 2015. Section 8 has significantly changed. We understood that a matter can be referred against non-parties also. A matter can be referred on the request of non-parties also. So therefore, the problem that you add your claims against non-parties in the suit and that is how you can defeat the purpose of Section 8 is not that relevant anymore. So if it is a case of composite transaction, the matter can be referred even against non-parties. That is what we saw. Although we also discussed that splitting of the matter into something which can be arbitrated and something which can be tried is not contemplated by the legislation. This was not the intention of the legislature. Therefore, splitting or bifurcation of the matter is not permissible. That is what we discussed in the previous lecture. And now we have moved on to a next chapter altogether. I have skipped section 9 because I will be taking section 9 along with section 17. 9 relates to power of court to pass interim measures. Section 17 relates to power of tribunal to pass interim measures. So I propose to take 9 along with 17. So now I will straight away come to section 10. 10 is part of a scheme of this act which includes 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So from 10 to 15, there is one scheme. That is everything about composition of the tribunal. We will discuss the number of arbitrators in section 10. Then we have the procedure to appoint arbitrators in section 11. Then you have certain requirements of, of independence and impartiality of the arbitrators in section 12. 12, in fact, give me grounds to challenge an arbitrator. 13 gives me procedure to challenge an arbitrator. All these relate to composition. 14 again gives me grounds to or something to do with challenge to arbitrator. 14.2 again talks about some procedure before the court and 15 predominantly talks about substitute in case an arbitrator is challenged and he is removed, how to find a substitute is to be found in section 15. So from 10 to 15 is one scheme 
and that is what we will discuss now onwards. Section 10 is number of arbitrators. As you can see, the parties are free to determine the number of arbitrators. So it starts with the freedom, but then it limits the freedom, provided that such number shall not be an even number. It is not difficult to understand this provision. The parties are free to determine the number of arbitrators, provided that such number shall not be an even number. There is a difference between saying the same thing in two different languages. I could have written that parties are free to determine the number of arbitrators, provided that such number shall be odd number. The other way of writing the same thing is provided that such number shall not be an even number. The first statement would have been a mandatory statement. The second statement is a negative mandate statement. This is a stricter mandate. So this indicates that although you have freedom, but your freedom is, is curtailed and you cannot appoint even number of arbitrators in any case. There will never be even number of arbitrators. So the language very clearly suggests that it is a very strict mandatory provision. Subsection 2 says, failing the determination referred to in subsection 1, if parties fail to determine number of arbitrators, failing the determination referred to in subsection 1, that is if parties fail to determine the number of arbitrators, then the default mechanism is that arbitral tribunal shall consist of sole arbitral. Now, this on this point, there is difference between Indian law and ancestral model law because in case no determination is done in clause 1 of ancestral article 10, then the tribunal shall consist of three arbitrators. In our case, the tribunal shall consist of sole arbitrator and we can understand the difference. We do not want to make it a costly affair for the parties in case they fail to decide the number of arbitrators. Indian law does not impose, does not want to impose the number as three on, on the party. So therefore, validly it has been kept as sole arbitrator. So that is one point on which Indian law differs from ancestral. Otherwise, in ancestral model also parties have the freedom to decide number of arbitrators provided that such number shall not be an even number. And I have already mentioned that the language makes it very clear that this is not just a mandatory provision, it has been drafted in a negative mandate language. Now it is very simple to find, to read the statement, but despite that some issues arose in relation to section 10 in a case called as Narayan Prashad Lohia versus Nikunj Kumar Lohia and others. Narayan Prashad Lohia versus Nikunj Kumar Lohia and others. This is AIR 2002, Supreme Court 1139. What happened here is, there was an arbitration agreement between two parties in which they wrote that in case of dispute, the matter shall be referred for arbitration to be done by a tribunal consisting of two arbitrators, Mr. A and Mr. B. Both the parties agreed to this idea that it will be a tribunal consisting of two arbitrators. Can we do that? No. Because section 10 says, it shall not be even. You have the freedom. You can decide 1 or 3 or 5 or 7, but you cannot agree on an even number of arbitrators. But what they did here in this case, the parties agreed that in case of any dispute, the matter shall be referred for arbitration to be done by a tribunal consisting of two arbitrators. And both the parties participated in the process of appointment of arbitrators. And once the tribunal is created, both the parties participated in the process of arbitration throughout the process of arbitration. And finally, an award was passed. Once the award was passed, now one party goes to the court and says, my lord, the award has been passed by a tribunal which was wrongly constituted. And section 34, we will have a separate discussion on section 34 later on. Section 34 gives me grounds on which an arbitral award may be challenged, may be set aside. You do not have many grounds on which an arbitral award can be challenged. It is a very limited list of 7-8 grounds on which an arbitral award may be challenged. And once one of the grounds is faulty procedure or faulty composition. If the award has been passed by a tribunal which consists of faulty or wrong number of arbitrators, if the composition of tribunal is faulty or if the procedure followed by the tribunal is faulty, 
then such an award is liable to be set aside by way of an application filed under section 34. This ground is there in 34, 2A5. We will talk about this ground also later on. So, now the award here in this case of Narayan Prashad Lohia was challenged by one of the parties on the ground that the award has been passed by a tribunal which was constituted in violation of section 10, which is a mandatory provision drafted in negative mandate language. Now, High Court accepts the argument and sets aside the arbitral award because it has been passed by a tribunal which was wrongly constituted which was constituted in violation of section 10 and then the matter comes before the Supreme Court following issues were raised. First, before the Supreme Court it was said that the composition of tribunal was wrong therefore the award is liable to be set aside. It was asked that if the composition is faulty why did not you raise it before the arbitral tribunal try and understand there is a connection between section 16 and section 34. There are grounds in section 34, for example, one of the ground is that you can, op, you can challenge an arbitral award if you think that you did not get sufficient opportunity to present your case. You did not get sufficient opportunity to present your case before the tribunal. In that case, you have a ground to challenge an arbitral award. But when you raise this point before the court, the first question court is going to ask you is, why did you not raise this question before the tribunal? Another ground on which you can challenge an arbitral award is when the award has been passed in excess of jurisdiction of the tribunal. Tribunal did not have the jurisdiction still passed an award in excess of what is submitted to the tribunal. I submitted three issues, tribunal has decided four issues. So, it is an invalid award because it has gone beyond what was submitted to it. If it was going beyond what was submitted to you, did you raise the challenge? If you did not raise the challenge before the tribunal, you cannot subsequently raise the point in section 34. So, there is a connection between 16 and 34. You have the opportunity to raise objections in section 16 and there is a timeline prescribed for raising the objection. We will read those provisions. And you have to do it within that timeline. If you do not do it, you cannot subsequently do it in section 34 at a very late stage. So, therefore, the first question was, why did you not raise it before the arbitral tribunal? There is an interesting explanation to this point. It was argued that we could not raise it before the tribunal because unfortunately, there was no tribunal in existence. Although the parties were participating in the process of arbitration, they participated in process of appointment. Tribunal came into existence. They participated in the entire process of arbitration and award was passed. But what now they are saying that we could not raise the issue that you are wrongly constituted and therefore you do not have jurisdiction to go ahead with the matter. Why? Because unfortunately there was no, no tribunal in existence. A wrongly constituted tribunal is as bad as no tribunal in place. The wrong constitution of tribunal in violation of section 10 would mean it will strike at the root of jurisdiction. The situation is as if there is no tribunal. And if there is no tribunal, where will I go and raise the question of lack of jurisdiction? So, that is the reason why I did not raise the question. So, the argument was the composition question cannot be raised before the tribunal because a tribunal consisting of faulty composition is no tribunal at all. So, therefore, by the fact that we did not raise this point before the tribunal does not mean we have waived our right to object. We have not waived our right to object. Had there been a tribunal in place, we would have raised this issue before the tribunal. In any case, if you want to allow a tribunal consisting of even number of arbitrators, what will happen? Imagine, there may be a situation and in most of the cases that situation will arise that two arbitrators are divided on some issue and there is no majority constituted, there will be no judgment, there will be no decision. And in that case, the parties are left with no option but to go back to trial or redo arbitration again.
by appointing odd number of arbitrators. So why are you insisting on even number of arbitrators? Insisting on even number of arbitrators would mean colossal wastage of time and resources. That would mean that you are compelling parties to undergo the entire process only to come to a conclusion that there is no award, no majority constituted. And you go back to stage one, appoint three arbitrators and redo everything. That would mean wastage of time and energy. Further, section 34.2a5, I just mentioned section 34, one of the grounds to challenge an arbitral award is faulty composition and faulty procedure adopted. Section 34.2a5 clearly says that if it is wrongly constituted, then award passed by such a tribunal is liable to be set aside. These were the arguments presented that we did not raise it in 16 because there is no tribunal. If it is wrongly constituted, it, it is as bad as no tribunal in existence. Since we did, did not raise it before the tribunal does not mean we have waived our right to raise an objection. That should not be the case. Now, in the light of these arguments, we will read some of the provisions. We will read section 4, some of the aspects of section 16, some of the aspects of section 34 to understand the nature of section 10. Of course, we will also refer to something from section 11 of that. Let us see what is there in section 4 of that. It relates to waiver of right to object. Waiver of right to object. A party who knows that any provision of this part from which parties may derogate or any requirement under the arbitration agreement has not been complied with and yet proceeds with the arbitration without stating his objection to such non-compliance without undue delay or if a time limit is provided for stating that objection within that period of time shall be deemed to have waived his right to so object. What do you see in section 4? There are two parts. If a party knows that the provision is a derogable provision, derogable provision means it is a non-mandatory provision. It is a provision from which parties may derogate. If there is a derogable provision or if there is a, any term or anything in uh, of the arbitration agreement, any condition of the arbitration agreement, which has been breached by the other party. The other party has breached either any of the provisions of this act which are derogable or any of the terms of the arbitration agreement. I know that the other party has breached one of these and still I participate in the arbitration without stating my objection. Then it will be assumed that I have waived my right to object. I have a right to object to any breach. By virtue of section 4, I have a right to object to any breach of any of the provisions of this act or any of the terms of the arbitration agreement. But if I do not raise the objection, and when should I raise the objection? If there is a timeline given, I must raise the objection within that timeline. And if there is no timeline prescribed in the act, then I must raise the objection within reasonable time period. Now, if I fail to raise an objection in relation to what? Breach of derogable provision. Breach of any of the terms of the arbitration agreement. Means a breach of mandatory provision cannot be waived. Even if I do not raise an objection, it is never going to produce a valid award. Try to understand this point. That, will ex that explains the scope of section 4. Only the breach of derogables can be waived. Breach of mandatory provision cannot be waived. Even if I do not raise an objection, it has not been waived by me. It is not deemed to have been waived by me. And any award passed on the basis of breach of mandatory provision is not going to sustain and can be easily set aside. What can be waived? Breach of terms of the agreement, breach of derogable provisions. If party knows that it is a breach of derogable, if party knows that it is breach of arbitration agreement, one of the terms of arbitration agreement, and still party participates in the process of arbitration, it is deemed that he has waived his right to object if he do not raise an objection. As I said, 
within what time period objection must be raised if there is a timeline prescribed raise the objection within that time period otherwise deemed to have been waived if no timeline is prescribed raise the objection within reasonable time period it was argued that this is not the case in the present situation because section 10 is not a derogable provision it's a mandatory provision section 16 gives you a timeline let's go to section 16 that completes our discussion on 10 and 14 section 16 as i mentioned in the last session also it is about competence of arbitral tribunal to rule on its jurisdiction section 16 incorporates the principle of competence competence it has got two aspects first tribunal has the jurisdiction to rule on its jurisdiction it is a tribunal which will decide whether it has jurisdiction in a given case and second it is a tribunal which will for the first time decide validity of the arbitration agreement this is the scope of doctrine of competence competence we'll have separate discussion on this doctrine also now section 16 says in subsection 2 a plea that arbitral tribunal does not have jurisdiction shall be raised not later than the submission of the statement of defense however a party shall not be precluded from raising such a plea merely because that he has appointed or participated in the appointment of an arbitrator there are two things written in section 16 subsection 2 first it gives us a timeline within which objection as regards jurisdiction of the tribunal must be raised if any of the parties is of the view that the tribunal does not have jurisdiction the objection must be raised before submitting on merits before submitting the statement of defense because once you start submitting on defense then it will be assumed that you have not raised your objection within the prescribed time period and if you have not raised the objection within prescribed time period by virtue of section 4 you have waived your right to object so first thing is a timeline has been given within which objection as regards lack of jurisdiction must be raised and second point is a kind of clarification where the provision says that you can raise anybody can raise the objection you are not disentitled from raising the objection merely on the ground that you have also participated in appointment of the arbitrator court will not say that uh, a few days back you yourself appointed this arbitrator and now you are saying that he is he does not have jurisdiction and you are challenging the jurisdiction you cannot do that this cannot be said so even if you have participated in the process of appointment of arbitrator still you can challenge that arbitrator now if we put things together we get some meaning it's here court says section 4 section 10 and section 16 are part of one scheme because if you remember there was an argument that we did not raise the question of lack of jurisdiction before the tribunal because there was no tribunal in place a, a wrongly constituted tribunal is as bad as no tribunal and if there is no tribunal where should i raise the objection and as i did not raise the objection you cannot assume that i have waived my right but what court says you can see it here Section 4, 10 and 16 are part of the integrated scheme provided in the Act. Parties have the freedom to decide number of arbitrators in the provision. Even after the party has agreed for the even number of arbitrators, he can still object to the composition, not later than the date of submission of the statement of defense. Let's go step by step. Section 16 says lack of jurisdiction objection regarding lack of jurisdiction can be raised what all can be the reasons for lack of jurisdiction the most important reason is wrong composition so when the provision says that lack of jurisdiction the objection regarding lack of jurisdiction can be raised 
it means it includes the point of wrong composition. So therefore it is very clear that composition question can be raised. Once we accept, once we understand that composition questions can be raised, that means it must be raised within the time limit given in 16.2. And if it is not raised within the time limit given in 16.2, it is deemed to have been waived. It is deemed to have been waived by virtue of section 4. What can be waived? Breach of derogables can be waived. What are we referring to? We are referring to breach of section 10. If breach of section 10 can be waived, does it not mean that section 10 is a derogable provision? So I will explain this point once again, but before that let me go back whatever I told you in relation to section 4, in relation to section 16, in relation to section 10, because this is not just important for 10, you will also have to understand the provisions, other provisions which I am referring to. Whatever I explained so far, let us understand that. My point was, there was a tribunal consisting of even number of arbitrators. Parties appointed even number of arbitrators. The agreement provided for even number of arbitrators. And once the tribunal was constituted, parties participated in the process. Award was passed. Now, one party is challenging the award. Now, when he is challenging the award, he is saying that the award has been passed by a wrongly constituted tribunal. I have already explained that there is a connection between section 16 and section 34. Section 16 is the provision which talks about jurisdiction of the tribunal. If at all you have to raise an objection regarding jurisdiction, you must first of all raise it in section 16 before the tribunal and if that is not rightly decided, then only you get a standing to challenge the award under section 34 on the ground of excess of jurisdiction. Now, in this case, throughout the process when the party participated in the arbitration and now when it is challenging the award on the ground of faulty composition, the first question as I said was asked as to why did you not raise it before the tribunal and they said composition question cannot be raised before the tribunal. Why composition question cannot be raised before the tribunal? because a wrongly constituted tribunal is ad, as bad as no tribunal in place at all. Because I said by virtue of section 4, there is a possibility of waiver of right to object. We said there are two things the breach of which can be waived. If there is a derogable provision and the other party is committing breach of that derogable provision, it is for me whether to object or waive the right to object. Similarly, if the other party is committing breach of some, some terms of the arbitration agreement, it is for me to object or waive my right to object. But if the other party is committing breach of mandatory provision, it is not on me to waive it because the breach of mandatory provisions cannot be waived. This was the background. Now, when, when the parties are arguing that we could not have raised the question of composition before the tribunal, court says this is the wrong understanding. Because lack of jurisdiction, which is discussed in section 16, can arise of many regions and one of the region is wrong constitution of the tribunal. So it is wrong to say that composition question cannot be raised before the tribunal. Section 4, 16 and 10 part of the same scheme. Section 10 is about composition. If composition is not valid, you must raise it before the tribunal itself in section 16. Because composition questions can be raised. This is one of the reasons for lack of jurisdiction. Raise composition question in 16 within the time frame given in section 16 itself. And the time frame is you have to raise it before submitting your statement on the defense. And if you fail to do it, then by virtue of section 4, it is deemed to have been waived. What has been waived? What can be waived? Only the breach of derogables can be waived. What are we talking about? We are talking about breach of section 10. So that proves 
that section 10 is a derogable provision. Now, why am I emphasizing on such a small provision? Because despite such clear language which you see in section 10, I believe this is the most clearly worded provision in the entire act. It is very clear to say that section 10 is a mandatory provision. It is drafted in a negative mandate language. Still, court comes to the conclusion here in Narayan Prashad Lohia case that section 10 is a derogable provision. And how did court come to the conclusion? But with the help of section 4, section 16, saying that 4, 10 and 16 is part of one scheme. There is a breach of 10, raise it in 16, Within the time frame, if you don't raise it in 16, it is deemed to have been waived. What can be waived? Only derogables can be waived. Breach of derogables can be waived. Therefore, 10 is derogable. Point number one. The second point is, as we will discuss in our next session, we will talk about section 11, procedure for appointment of arbitrator. Section 10 provides for various various methods to appoint arbitrators, for example, how to appoint arbitrators if the number is 1, how to appoint arbitrators in case the number is 3. It was argued that, see, section 11 only talks about odd number of arbitrators, but court said 11 does not talk about 5 number of arbitrators. Does it mean you cannot appoint 5 number of arbitrators? So, don't draw any lesson from the language of section 11. The only thing which we can find out from section 11 is that an even number of tribunal, even number of arbitrators will always have this freedom to find out the third arbitrator if there is a need arising. If there is no need arising and if both the arbitrators take the same view and majority is constituted. What will the third arbitrator do? Nothing. Can the third arbitrator disturb the majority or change the majority? No. So, they do not require a third arbitrator. They may pass the award. But in case they, they come to the conclusion that probably we are divided, then in that case they may invite the third arbitrator and the third arbitrator will constitute the majority by joining one arbitrator or the other. So, even if they do not start with three arbitrators, there is always a possibility to bring the third one at a later stage so as to break the tie. And therefore, this flexibility of section 11 also supports the point that section 10 cannot be read as a mandatory provision. Section 10 must be read as a derogable provision. There is no benefit on insisting on even number of arbitrators. It was argued initially that if you appoint two arbitrators and towards the end it is discovered that two arbitrators are unable to form the majority and no award could be passed, that would mean colossal wastage of time and resources. Contrary to this, court says that setting aside an arbitral award only on the technical ground that it has been passed by even number of arbitrators, even if the majority is constituted, that would mean colossal wastage of time and resources. Setting aside an arbitral award on the technical ground that it has been passed by a tribunal consisting of even number of arbitrators, even if majority is, is, is constituted, that would mean wastage of time and resources. That would mean violation of public policy of India. Therefore, let us not insist on mandatory nature of section 10. That is what court concludes. Despite the mandatory language, the court concludes that section 10 is not a mandatory provision, it is a derogable provision. How court concludes it? On the basis of combined reading of 4, 10 and 16, on the basis of some flexibility available in section 11, on the ground of public interest and also on the ground of interpretation of section 34 to A5. Section 34 to A5. Section 34, as I said, talks about application for setting aside arbitral award. 34 is a provision in which you challenge an arbitral award. It is recourse against an arbitral award. And 34 subsection 1 says recourse to a court against an arbitral award may be made only by an application 
for setting aside such award in accordance with subsection 2 and subsection 3. So, you can challenge an arbitral award by way of an application subject to subsection 2 and subsection 3. Subsection 2 gives you grounds for challenging an arbitral award and subsection 3 tells you the time period within which you must file the application, the limitation period. The grounds which are there in subsection 2 can be divided into two parts. There are first five grounds which are there in 342A and there are two more grounds which you have in 342B. So, total of seven grounds are there in subsection 2 of section 34 on which you can challenge an arbitral award. For example, incapacity of the parties when they entered into the arbitration agreement, invalidity of the arbitration agreement, due process not complied with, tribunal acted beyond jurisdiction. Fifth ground is tribunal is wrongly constituted or tribunal adopted wrong procedure. We are concerned with this fifth point. An arbitral award may be set aside by the court, subsection 2 of section 34. An arbitral award may be set aside by the court only if the party making the application furnishes proof that clause 5. Now listen to me carefully. The composition of the arbitral tribunal, because we won't be explaining it again when we'll discuss section 34. So let's understand it here itself. One of the grounds to challenge an arbitral award is that the composition of the arbitral tribunal or the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. So far I've been saying that the award has been passed by a wrongly constituted tribunal. What do we mean by that? That the composition of the tribunal was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. Unless such agreement was in conflict with the provision of this part from which parties cannot derogate or failing such agreement was not in accordance with this part. Now you will accept that clause 5 of subsection 2a talks about two stages. Step 1 when you are deciding the composition in accordance with the agreement between the parties. If I go back to sub clause 5, the composition of the arbitral tribunal was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. Unless such agreement was in conflict with a provision of this part from which parties cannot derogate. So what does it mean? The composition was not in accordance with the agreement provided that we will come to this stage. See what it means? We have to examine the composition with respect to agreement of the parties. A composition is valid if it is in accordance with agreement of the parties provided that the agreement itself is valid according to mandatory provisions of this part. Composition is valid if it is valid in accordance with the agreement. Agreement itself must be valid according to the mandatory provisions of this part. Step 2, read the last line, or failing such agreement was not in accordance with this part. What do we mean by failing such agreement? Failing such agreement means we do not have a valid agreement. If you have a valid agreement, valid agreement with respect to mandatory provisions of this part, you compare the composition with agreement and if it matches, composition is fine. So compare the composition with the agreement. Provided, first of all, compare the agreement with the mandatory provisions of part 1. Step 2, there is no valid agreement, then how will you test whether the composition is valid or not? If there is no valid agreement, how will you test whether composition is valid or not? You directly compare the composition with the mandatory provisions of this part. This was what was argued. Try to understand section 34.2a5. 34.2a5 says, composition is valid with respect to agreement. Then it is fine, provided agreement must be valid with the mandatory part. If you do not have a valid agreement, then how will you test the composition? You test it directly with respect to mandatory part. This was the interpretation which was presented before the court. 
But if you carefully examine this interpretation, what are we doing in both the steps? We are comparing this and comparing this with this. Composition, agreement, mandatory provisions of this part. So A is equal to B, B is equal to C. Actually, we are doing A equals to C. Try and understand. A equals to B, B equals to C. Actually, we are doing A equals to C. In the second part, we are directly doing A equals to C. So, in effect, in both the stages, we are actually comparing the composition with the mandatory provisions of the part. This cannot be the correct interpretation. You cannot expect legislature to ask you to do same thing twice in the same provision. So, court discarded this interpretation and gave another interpretation to this provision. That is what we have on this screen. Court says that the interpretation presented was flawed. You cannot expect legislature to ask parties to do the same thing twice in the same provision. Step one, you are comparing the composition with the mandatory provisions of part one indirectly. Step two, you are doing it directly. Now, what is the interpretation given? Court says, listen to me carefully. Court says, composition is valid if it is in agreement, it, if it is in accordance with the agreement of the parties. It is valid. Composition is valid if it is in accordance with the agreement between the parties. Second is, if it is not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. So, if it is according to the agreement, it is valid. If it is not according to the agreement, there are two possibilities. See if the agreement itself is valid. Second, see if the agreement is invalid. Let us do it again. Step 1, composition according to the agreement, composition which is not in accordance with the agreement. If it is in accordance with the agreement, it is valid. If it is not in accordance with the agreement, there are two situations. It may be valid according to mandatory provisions. It may be invalid according to mandatory provisions. If it is valid according to mandatory provisions, it is fine. It is only when the composition is neither according to the agreement nor according to the mandatory provisions that it can be challenged. So, as long as composition is valid according to the agreement, no challenge. So, what is important is the agreement. If agreement provides for even number of arbitrators, you create even number of arbitrators, your composition is perfect. That is the interpretation given by the Supreme Court. If agreement says let us have three and still you have two, then it is invalid. If agreement says let us have two and you have three, then it is invalid. So, as long as you are in accordance with the agreement, there is no challenge. Failing such agreement in section 34 to a 5 means absence of anything on composition. When the agreement does not talk about composition at all, when agreement does not talk about composition at all, then in that case only you can compare the composition directly with the mandatory provisions. But as long as agreement provides for composition, your test must end when you come to the conclusion that composition is valid with respect to the agreement. That is the importance of agreement in this interpretation given by the court. So, as long as it is in accordance with the agreement, it is valid. That proves that agreement is more important. Section 10 is not that important. If agreement says that there will be even number of arbitrators, then composition must be even. And breach of 10, therefore, is not a significant breach. This also proves that section 10 is a derogable provision. So, the conclusion of Narayan Prashad Lohia case was that section 10, although it may have been drafted in negative mandate language, it is a derogable provision. And it has been concluded on the basis of interpretation of combined reading of 4, 10 and 16. It has been decided on the basis of some meaning which we derive from section 11. And it has been decided on the basis of interpretation of section 34 to a 5. The judgment was criticized by many authors. 
when do you need interpretation of a particular provision when there is some ambiguity in case there is no ambiguity in the provision should you still interpret it and when do we require external aid of interpreting a provision why should you interpret section 10 in the light of 34 to a 5 when 10 itself has been drafted in such clearly worded terms so there have been criticism of the judgment of narayan prashad lohia but still this is the law and the law is that section 10 is not a, a mandatory provision it is a derogable provision there is one point left which i will discuss before i conclude this discussion we have already understood that section 10 is a derogable provision the next question is what do you mean by derogable provision in this case of dr deepashri versus sultan chand and sons this is delhi high court 2008 judgment there was a publication contract between the author and the publisher which said that in case of a dispute in case of a dispute the same shall be referred to a tribunal consisting of two arbitrators when dispute arose dr deepa shri the author wrote to the publisher that since the amount of claim is very small i will prefer to appoint a sole arbitrator kindly give your consent to the name which i am proposing the publishers responded that we want specific performance of the arbitration agreement since the agreement provides for even number of arbitrators therefore we will go by even number of arbitrators let's appoint two arbitrators since there was no agreement the author approaches the high court with a request to appoint an arbitrator the question involved in this case is can the publisher rely on an agreement which is providing for even number of arbitrator keeping in view the nature of section 10 because they are insisting on specific performance of the agreement and therefore they are insisting on appointment of two arbitrators whereas deepa shri is saying that let us appoint one arbitrator she is raising an objection and in this case an objection regarding even number of arbitrator was raised at the time of appointment of arbitrator itself kindly compare this case with narayan prashad lohia in narayan prashad lohia the objection regarding faulty composition was raised at a post award stage at the stage of challenging the award in section 34 whereas in dr deepa shri versus sultan chand and sons the objection regarding breach of section 10 is raised at a preliminary stage of appointment of arbitrators although parties may have originally agreed for even number of arbitrators now the party is raising an objection and this is the right stage because if you recall i said in section 16 composition question has to be raised before submitting on merit before submitting your statement on merit composition question has to be raised jurisdictional issue has to be raised now what happens here jurisdictional issue composition question is raised by dr deepasri even before establishment of the tribunal so it is well within time court held that this case is different from narayan prashad lohia case because in that case objection was raised after the time for which within which you have you had to raise it it has expired so it is well within the time and when you raise the objection within time then it is not deemed to have been waived by you we will not assume that you have waived your right to object and therefore in this case you have a right to object to even number of arbitrators that exactly is the meaning of derogable nature derogable nature means it can be derogated parties can derogate from it derogable nature does not mean it is not relevant at all it only means that parties can prefer to derogate from it parties may not follow it 
but if one of the parties insists it no more remains derogable if one of the party insists on its application it no more remains derogable so that is the meaning of derogable nature of section 10 a particular provision is derogable means parties can derogate from it parties can move out of it but that can happen if both the parties waive their right to object but if any of the parties do not waive the right to object and raise the objection within the permitted time limit then it no more remains derogable now apply it in the instant case Dr. Deepashri raises the objection that the agreement provides for even number of arbitrators that is in violation of section 10. I have an objection and she has raised objection before submitting her statement on defense of the case, before submitting her statement on merits of the case. So her objection is well within time. So, she objects to it. Now, the situation is there is nothing valid within in the agreement regarding composition. Try and understand this point. If I object to the composition part in the beginning itself means the agreement provides there shall be two arbitrators. I am objecting to it saying that this is in violation of section 10. Once I object to it, then you cannot appoint two arbitrators. Then the situation is as if there is no determination on composition. Once that is determined, once an objection has been raised, it means even number of arbitrators can now not be appointed. And therefore, the situation is as if there is no determination of number of arbitrators. And if there is no determination of number of arbitrators, if you recall in the beginning when we were reading section 10, we said 10, section 10 subsection 2 says, in case there is no number determined by the parties, then there shall be a sole arbitrator appointed. Now, in the instant case of Dr. Deepashri versus Sultan Chand and Sons, court finally comes to the conclusion that since she raises the objection within time, the provision no more remains derogable, it has to be insisted upon and therefore in the light of these circumstances, you cannot appoint even number of arbitrators and the situation is as if there is no determination as regards number. If there is no determination as regards number, then subsection 2 will come in picture and there shall be a sole arbitrator appointed and therefore in this case, High Court, Delhi High Court appoints a sole arbitrator. So that is how the meaning of derogable nature was explained by Delhi High Court. So therefore, derogable nature does not mean you have to completely come out of it. Derogable nature only means that you can waive breach of that particular provision. However, if it is not waived, that means the party can insist on application of the provision. The interpretation of section 10 given in Narayan Prashad Lohia case was criticized also as I mentioned, but it has not been overruled so far. So that remains the law in relation to section 10 and the nature of section 10. So we have understood uh, the Arbitration Conciliation Act up to section 10, except section 9 which I said I will take up along with section 17. In the next lecture we will go on to another aspect of of the composition of the tribunal that is an arbitral tribunal. So, so procedure to appoint arbitrators. So, that is it for, for, uh, for this session on the nature of section 10. We will meet again with our discussion on section 11 that is procedure to appoint arbitrators. Thank you very much.
many a times we all think who am I, why am I doing whatever I am doing, why do I feel attracted towards others, why do I feel very aggressive in certain instances, why certain people or certain type of acts they repel me. Why is it that I always search for certain things which look very, very ambiguous? These are the things, these are the questions that all of us experience, all human beings. And you would realize that many a times certain domains of knowledge, especially within social sciences and all sciences at large, when you look at it from a philosophical point of view, they would try to give you the answers to these questions. Now, one of the branches of understanding which helps you understand things much better, which also helps you understand not only what is visibly present before you, what is glaringly apparent to you, rather which also uh, know, tells you what is not visible at all, what, what goes within. Okay. And this is the subject knowledge what is called as psychology. It is not only that it helps you understand the manifested behavior, the overt behavior, how you talk, how you speak, how you say it, how you interact, how you respond, not only that, but also what goes within, what makes you do this, what makes you think this way, what makes you act that way. Why is it that certain things you appreciate? certain things you feel attracted towards and why is it that many a times in certain type of situations you feel you should completely go out of it, you should not get any way involved into it, the repulsion. Why is it that certain acts although you do not appreciate still you get involved into it. Then you reinterpret your own behavior and you start giving birth to certain type of experiences, shame, guilt, pleasure, appreciation. You see world in a particular way, you analyze it in a particular way, you derive emotion out of it, feeling out of it and the mix of what you perceived along with what you experience, it makes you act in a particular way, respond in a particular way your response is received by somebody else and then the other person also responds in that situation. Now, there are situations where several people interact simultaneously, the situation remains constant and different people interact at the same time, you realize that your identity gets lost. You are not an individual, you act what is called as group behavior. You realize that you do not have an explanation for either, either favoring somebody or completely being unfavorable to the other person. You later on realize that it was a favorable or an unfavorable attitude towards that individual. You realize that you repeat certain form of behavior. Why? You do not know. People tell you that such type of repetitions are not normal. Human beings largely do not do that. And then you realize that okay, this is a particular pattern of a behavior for which I require the help of a specialist. The specialist tells me that this pattern of behavior is given a particular taxonomy, a particular nomenclature, which is either some aberration in the normal behavior, it is a neurotic form of a behavior, psychotic form of a behavior, it could be a psychosomatic response. And psychology, it covers all of this. So, if you want to understand yourself, if you want to understand others, this is the subject which helps you achieve that target. It is behavioral sciences that makes you understand human beings, human responses, human existence in complete totality.